Our first speaker today really needs no introduction, but for the sake of formality, he is a leading authority on financial markets and fintechs globally. He's the author of several best-selling books, including Digital Bank, Value Web, and Digital Human. He's been voted one of the most influential people in financial technology by the Wall Street Journal and Thomson Reuters. And he sits on the advisory board of many leading fintech companies, most notably, of course, Meniga. Uh, finally, he loves an excuse to come visit us here in Iceland. That's why he's here. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Chris Skinner. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Reykjavik. An early start, and I'm impressed that everyone arrived so early. It's uh, impressive. Normally, if I go to a conference in Southern Europe, you'd have arrived at 11 o'clock, so arriving at 8.30 is pretty impressive. Um, yeah, I've got a stake in Meniger, and uh, I came to Reykjavik the first time about seven years ago, and did a tour of Iceland. It's an amazing country, uh, and I like it a lot, and so I'm delighted to be back, even though I can't stay very long. In that uh, I fly around the world non-stop these days. Um, and it shows how hot fintech is, I guess, and I get invited to fly around the world non-stop. Uh, so I was in Hong Kong last week, I'm flying to Singapore this evening, and then I'm in uh, Money 2020 Hangzhou, China next week, which is uh, where Ant Financial is based, and I'll touch on some of those themes. Equally, um, as mentioned, I've written quite a few books, and I blog every day, and uh, I blog every day because there's always something to talk about. There's always something interesting going on around the world of finance and technology. In that finance and technology are pretty predominant in, in our lives. I mean, money is one of the most important things for us because it enables us to live a good or a bad life. And technology is very important to us these days because we cannot be separated from it. We're attached to our phones like cyborgs. So it's very dominant in our lives, money and technology, finance and technology. It came home to me in that um, in Digital Human, I talk about the digital revolution of planet Earth and the fact that we are all connected in real time and everybody has access to the network. And some people disagree with me, but I think anybody in the world, if they want to communicate via the mobile network, can find somebody who has a mobile phone. Um, that's pretty obvious. But what's not, maybe not so obvious is that 20 years ago, when Bill Gates made that comment as referenced, uh, I was working in a co company called NCR, the cash machine company, that had a sister company called Teradata. And Teradata would analyze terabytes of data on behalf of massive companies like Walmart and Citibank. And they would spend millions to analyze these terabytes of data because analyzing terabytes of data was incredibly difficult 20 years ago. And yet today, we upload 60 terabytes of data to the internet every second. And that is quite stunning for me because it says that we have unlimited bandwidth, unlimited storage, unlimited networking, unlimited processing. There's no limits to what we can do with technology today. It's accessible everywhere for everyone. And that's the digital revolution of planet Earth. That is transformational. It's the reason why the biggest companies in the world today are digital. Amazon and Apple have trillion dollar valuations. And to put that in context, I recently moved to Poland. And you may wonder why. It's because I have a Polish wife. It's normally the reason. Um, and Poland has a GDP of $500 billion. So Apple could buy Poland and call it iPoland. They could buy two Polands, you know, and just rename them if they wanted to. And this is what's transformational. Now, in financial services, and I've been talking about this for the whole of my career, technology is changing the industry. But in the last decade, specifically in the last decade, it's transformed the industry. And it's illustrated by the fact that we're seeing industrial era companies becoming digital platforms and being replaced by new companies that provide that connectivity. Digital companies don't make or build anything. They just connect everything. And so that's the reason why Uber and Lyft and Airbnb are massive companies that don't actually have any taxis, cars, or hotels. They just connect people who have rooms and vehicles with people who need journeys and beds. 
And finally, in financial services, we're seeing the same happening here. Finally, in that the industrial era banks were built for the physical distribution of paper in a localized network of buildings and humans, and they're being replaced by specialist companies that deal with the digital distribution of data through software and servers. My favorite example is Stripe, mainly because it's been built by two young brothers, John and Patrick Collinson. And in 2016, their valuation was 22 times more per employee than JP Morgan Chase, who are a 200-year-old bank. This is the difference between industrial era thinking and digital era thinking. But what surprised me is that the valuation of Stripe was recently updated. And so right now, October 2018, they are 20 times more per employee, or $20 million more per employee. But what's notable is a change in JP Morgan Chase. If you didn't notice the previous slide, $1 million per employee, Two years later, $2 million per employee valuation. And equally, what's interesting is the number of people who have disappeared from the bank. Employees down one-third, market valuation up 50%. This is what's happening right now. This is the biggest change, that the industrial era of banks are becoming digital banks. Because they have to. Shutting down branches, automating jobs, getting rid of excess, software eating the world, because they have to. They have to respond to the digital transformation challenge. And that's what's interesting, because that's what's going on right now in every bank in the world that I talk to. And if they're not doing it, they won't survive. People say that banks will die. They're not gonna die, that's ridiculous. Banks will s survive as long as they adapt. And it's how fast you adapt as to how quickly you'll survive. And if you don't adapt, you'll get acquired. Simple as that. In fact, the bank business model I've talked about for a long time, and if you've seen me present before, you'll have seen these slides before, or a variation of them. You know, bank's business model is based on a back office that's all about manufacturing products and providing service and admin. A middle office is all about connecting front and back office. It's all the infrastructure, the transactions, connectivity. The front office is all about the customer intimacy, the relationship, the user experience. And this back, middle, front office has been something that's been around as a business model uh, ever since I was born. What's interesting is that most banks have tried to do all of these services, back, middle, front office, across all of these lines of business, retail, investment, private banking across the world as universal banks, and they've failed because banks cannot serve everybody everywhere, all the time, every time. Well, a lot of banks do a lot of things averagely. You can't do everything well, not across the whole world, across all these lines of business, across bank, middle, front office. And what FinTech's proven is that by specializing in doing one thing brilliantly well, they can break this business model apart. And that's what fintechs do. They focus upon doing one thing brilliantly well. You take Stripe, one thing brilliantly well, merchant checkout online. You take Klarna, one thing brilliantly well, online checkout. <laughs> they compete with each other. In fact, the back office was all about product and process and people, but now it's actually more about the digital connectivity between back, middle, front office. It's all more about platform and user experience. And so when I look at this, um, there's been some interesting examples. You know, Airbnb, I've already mentioned, connecting people who need rooms with people who have beds via a platform. And they're just connecting them. It's that connection in the platform between the product and the people. That's what platforms and marketplaces are all about. And the first time I ever heard anything talking about this in the fintech world was on March the 30th, 2005. That is the date when I think fintech was born in my head. Because on March the 30th, 2005, I was hosting a presentation in London from a person who talked about connecting people who want to buy something like a vehicle with people who have money through a platform. 
And at the end of the presentation, everyone walked out of the room and going, this guy is completely nuts. What the hell was that presentation about? We have no idea. The company was called Zopa, the first peer-to-peer -peer lender. And it was the day before their launch. They launched on the 1st of April, 2005. And Richard Duval talked about connecting people who need money with people who have money through a platform as an eBay for loans. And people thought he was in completely stupid in 2005. And yet today, Zopa in the UK has about 6% of the consumer loans marketplace. And they've been growing at almost doubling year on year. So 6% this year, 12% next year, 24% 2020. Three and a half billion pounds, $5 billion enabled lending through their platform. This is serious stuff. That's the reason why fintech is taken seriously. But Zopa does one thing brilliantly well, connecting people who have money with people who need money through a platform. And this is my core message, doing one thing brilliantly well through apps, APIs, and analytics. In fact, the revolution of the financial industry in the digital era is rebuilding the industry from the ground up on the internet through apps, APIs, and analytics getting rid of the buildings and the humans and replacing them with software and servers. The way to illustrate this really well is in the front office, those apps are really all viral. They're all based around mobile connectivity, but actually it's more than that. It's now smart things. Everything is smart. My phone, my house, my TV, my car, my clothes, everything is smart. And connecting everything through that front office user experience becomes interesting. Do I really want to authorize my television to download the Game of Thrones next season? No, it should do it for me. It knows me. I don't have to authorize anything. That virality is what's building that front office experience connectivity. A great example of that virality is these two guys, Ikram and Andy, who had a weekend together in 2010, and Ikram forgot his wallet. And so Andy wrote down every item that he was subsidizing at Cram 4. And at the end of the weekend, he said, you owe me $186.23, sc scrappy piece of paper. There you go. And Nick Cram said, oh, I'll put a check in the post when I get home tomorrow. And then they thought, this is ridiculous. We're millennials. We're coders. You can probably tell from the photo. Let's write some code to make it easy for me to pay you as you subsidize my paninis and martinis and cappuccinos. And they wrote Venmo that weekend. And Venmo has become one of the biggest viral social mobile networks for payments in the USA. Because when you get a message saying, you've got money, download Venmo. What are you going to do? Download Venmo or download Zelle, which is the bank's response to, to Venmo. These are the biggest social mobile payment systems in the USA. $150 billion transacted in 2017. Because it's viral, it's connected, it makes it easy. But the APIs in the middle office are actually far more interesting. The API marketplace makes absolute sense, particularly when you look at this chart, which is quite old now. But this is PayPal's internet development platform X, launched in 2011. And you see the revenue spiking up and the expense and the costs spiking down. And even more so when they launched their mobile development platform in 2013. And the reason why that happens is that with an API marketplace, if you're providing the platform, people take your code and integrate it into their systems. So they do the work, it's their cost, you get the transactions, it's your revenue. That's just a fantastic model of any business. And it's the reason why thousands of specialist companies have started doing APIs as one thing brilliantly well, because they know that you do the work, we get the revenue. That's the reason why it's so popular. And if you take Stripe, you know, two brothers who created seven lines of code that's valued now at $20 billion after seven years. It's quite incredible. And yet when they invented that system idea, they were teenagers. Teenagers are reinventing banking with code because they can. But the back office is where the action really is. The back office is all about intelligence. And it's all about analytics. It's all about having machines that can learn. And it's all about having this idea of artificial intelligence. 
It's illustrated really well by several companies. One of my favorite examples is JP Morgan, who have a system that can analyze their wholesale commercial contracts in one second, which previously took 360,000 hours of legal time. And the reason why it's my favorite example is we can fire all the lawyers, <laughs> get rid of them. But it just goes to show, you know, this intelligence we can build into machines can change the way we think and act. UBS used to have emails from high net worth clients that would take an average 45 minutes to administer the requirements. Now it can be done in a second by a machine, automatically. Releasing humans to do better work, like thinking about how to serve the client better. One of the most complicated things in investment banking is best execution because it requires you to think about lots of dimensions of instruction from the lowest cost, the lowest price, the fastest speed, the highest likelihood of settlement that no human can actually deal with, but machines can, and so they do. And it means that the investment banking markets are being completely automated. All the human traders are disappearing. This was UBS's trading floor in 2005 in New York. In fact, it's New Jersey, because it was just near Wall Street. This is it today. We can get rid of people. Yeah, and we worry about the jobs. Where, you know, what jobs will we have? Where do all the bankers go? Well, they create fintech startups. They go and do something else. But we become trainers, maintainers, sustainers, explainers. Trainers train the machines how to do their job. Explainers explain what the machine is doing to the people. And sustainers make sure the machine is corrected when it does something wrong. And in particular, we need to teach children to learn things that machines cannot learn. If machines can learn everything, then what can we learn that machines cannot learn? Emotions, creativity, empathy, ideas, music, art, things that machines cannot learn. They can replicate, of course they can, but a machine will never have a soul, and we have. So that's something we need to focus upon in our education. And no presentation is complete about FinTech without mentioning blockchain. There you go, done. Um, <laughs> blockchain, distributed ledger technology. ICOs, cryptocurrencies, gee gods, it's confusing. In fact, I think it combines everything that we don't understand about technology with everything we don't understand about money. It's like the most complicated thing ever. But the reason why it's important is it's transformational. You know, blockchain is gonna build the next generation of our world. It's a foundational technology. It's as important as the internet itself in terms of what it can do. And the reason why it's so important is that we can now share databases across the world with people we don't trust. And we could never do that before. That's the reason why, historically, we've had all this centralized management of everything. And we had to reconcile everything because we don't trust anybody. And yet now we can trust the network to do the job for us. So everyone has a copy of databases, everyone shares the databases, the databases are updated and authorized through the network automatically with no human hand involved. That gets rid of thousands of jobs, again. And it changes the whole way we think about things that we do, such as supply chain and trade finance. Get rid of all the bills of lading, the letters of credit, all the paper disappears and the whole thing is automatically updated through the network on a shared database between corporate clients and commercial banks. This is transformational. But it's gonna take a long time to happen. The hype around blockchain was ridiculous because everyone thought it would deliver yesterday. It's gonna to deliver tomorrow eventually. Once the corporate clients and the commercial banks and the governments and the institutions agree how it's gonna work, that's what takes time. The technology itself is amazing. The implementation takes time. Once it is implemented, it's transformational. It's as foundational as the internet itself. One of the key distributed ledger technologies that everyone seems to be buying into, including IBM with Hyperledger, is Ethereum. 
And there's the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance that has some amazing institutions behind it, such as Microsoft, JP Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, and others. But when you think about Ethereum, where did it come from? A teenager. Created by Vitalik Buterin when he was 19 years old. Teenagers are recreating the world of money, government, and business because they code. This is critical. Teenagers change the world. And when I look at the fintech world, there's thousands of fintech companies doing one thing brilliantly well through apps, APIs, and analytics. And nearly all of them have been created and founded by teenagers and millennials, young kids. And this is where fintech gets interesting. And I'm going to set up you in the cloud with this. I told you, I, I mention you every single presentation. He's, he's speaking next. But the reason I mention you in every presentation is that fintech to me is how you bring an old person together with a young person. I'm not saying you're old, Ewan. <laughs> but you look at me, you know, I'm grey-haired and wrinkled. I've been around a bit. And that's what banks are like. They're old, they're wrinkled, they've been around a bit. And what they want, and they're like a parent, they want stability, security, they want a nice home, they want to keep everything just so and wrap everything around so that nothing is broken, it's lovely, and it's stable and it's resilient and it's secure. And the kid comes in and starts kicking everything and going, I can break that, I can change that, I can do this, I'm challenging you. And that's the tech. So how do you get the parent and the child to work together collaboratively? And that's what fintech bank collaborations are like. So Ewan stood up last year in Oslo and said, I'm delighted to introduce our fintech partner, Spiff, Carl Nikolai, come to the stage. And Carl Nikolai jumped on the stage and his first words were, my three-year-old son likes to play with dinosaurs. So do we. <laughs> Not exactly respectful of their Nordia bank relationship. But I know where he's coming from, because I walk into an awful lot of banks' boardrooms and I'm met by a bunch of old people. You know, a bank's boardroom is full of people who don't get technology. 94% of banks' boardrooms have no one who's ever been in a technology job in their life, ever. That's ridiculous. How can you be a digital bank if you have no digital people in the leadership team? That's got to change. We've got to change the leadership team. In fact, what's interesting when I look at legacy is that we live in the legacy world of Europe and America. Nearly all of our infrastructure was implemented before Mark Zuckerberg was born. And we're trying to evolve it. It ain't going to work. You know, when you look at other economies like China, that's the reason why they're so incredibly f fast growing. Because they started without the legacy. It's illustrated well by when I launched the book Digital Human, Li Wang, who heads up Alipay for Europe, was on a panel with Ashok Vazwani, the CEO of Barclays Bank. And in the middle of the discussion, Li Wang said the average Alibaba employee generates $16 million a year in revenue. The average employee. And Ashok's face dropped. You know, the average Barclays employee produces about $400,000. That's the difference between fin and tech. Platforms connecting everybody versus digital, physical distribution structures. In fact, when I jump through this, I'm just going to jump to Eric Jing, because the reason why I picked on Ant Financial as a case study in the book is that Eric said at the World Economic Forum in 2017 that Ant Financial wants to deal and serve 2 billion people by 2025 through technology. And I thought, there's only 1.4 billion people in China, so what's going on here? And luckily enough, Ant Financial invited me to come and spend a week with them, and I produced a 30-page case study in the book. In fact, it's more than 30 pages, 30,000 words, <laughs> case study in the book, about this company. And what amazed me when I met Ant Financial is that I met the head of systems architecture, for example, and he said, we're on our fifth generation systems architecture. And this is a 15-year-old company. Their first generation systems were for escrow checkout, like Klarna. Their second generation used Oracle to provide payments. Their third generation needed scale, so they regenerated their systems using their own development technologies. Their fourth generation needed to handle 125,000 transactions per second 
average with every transaction guaranteed bulletproof with artificial intelligence and fraud analytics. Their fifth generation is to handle a million transactions per second average for two billion people. To put that in context, Visa globally handles an average 2,000 transactions per second. These guys are handling a million. On Singles Day last year, in the first five minutes, they processed a billion dollars of payments at an average 256,000 transactions per second. They processed $10 billion in the first hour. This is incredible scale. It's incredible vision. It's incredible different thinking. And now they've gone global. They're partnering with companies in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Thailand, in Pakistan, in India. Paytm is powered by Ant Financial's apps, APIs, and analytics. You don't know Ant Financial is there. They're behind the scenes. But their experiences, their technologies, their capabilities are the, are the intel inside so many payment services worldwide. And that's the reason why, if they were a technology company, they would be the 10th largest financial company in the world. But they're, sorry, they're not a technology company. They're not a financial company. They're a different way of thinking. A great way of illustrating their different way of thinking is this slide from their slide deck, which um, in the middle there, you've got Ant Financial, which is their payments platform. Just below that, you've got a layer called Marketing Services and Data Management Platform. And when I talk about artificial intelligence being the difference between the winners and losers, I think this illustrates it really well, because their data analytics platform is a key part of their layers of functionality. And they call it Ali Mama, because Mama looks after Baba. <laughs> yeah, this is where the action is. And this is where everything is completely different in China. Um, this is just the icing on the cake. You know, there's so many layers that I could talk about in China, about different ways of thinking. Although, having said that, uh, I was in Hong Kong last week and it did make me laugh because this guy was my driver. And he's got all these phones on his dashboard and yet he wouldn't take an electronic payment. He insisted I had to pay cash. <laughs> so, in conclusion, we have these three big forces of change with digital technology revolutionizing finance. We've got the startups, we've got the technology giants, we've got the banks. The startups are challenged because they have no history, little capital, and little trust. And equally, they're quite naive because the idea that dinosaurs can be just eradicated by these new startups is ridiculous. The dinosaurs are not going to disappear. And that's the reason why fintech bank collaborations are sprouting up everywhere. And that we'll see more of them. The technology giants are interesting, and it was interesting in the poll at the start just now, and that you guys named GAFA, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple. And yet you look in the wrong way, because I talk about fat bags. <laughs> Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, Badu, Alibaba, Google. You've got to include the eastern giants with the western giants. If you only look at the western giants, you're going to miss the game. And these technology giants have billions of capital, billions of customers decades of history, but I don't think they want to get into banking. I think they want to collaborate with banks because banking has too many regulations. It's too difficult for them. And the banks have millions of customers, centuries of history and billions of capital, and sometimes call themselves technology companies that happen to have a banking license. But that's actually missing the key point, which is we have an industry that's grown up over three centuries or more that's regulated for a reason. In fact, we have five times more regulation than technology companies, because we've been around a lot longer. And those regulations exist for a reason, which is all about trust. We will not lose your money. And if you trust a technology company with your money, you're stupid, because they're not regulated like we are. That's the reason why banks are around and have to be collaborated with, and will be around for a long time to come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Inspirational as always. We've had uh, an incredible amount of questions popping up. Popping up. I suggest we take, maybe, uh, or you take, maybe.
two or three of the most <laughs> liked ones here? I like the first one. Who do you bank with today? So I bank with several banks. Um, my main business account is with Barclays Bank. And um, Barclays Bank will think I'm their best digital company, c customer rather. Um, I open my Barclays ba uh, Bank app about three or four times a day. Uh, and they, they'll say, look, Chris Skinner uses our app three or four times a day. He's such an engaged customer. I never open my Monzo app. I'm, I'm also with Monzo. Um, but I'm much more engaged with Monzo. I'm not engaged with Barclays at all. Um, and the reason why I'm engaged with Monzo is that Monzo tell me through alerts when something's happened on my account, and Barclays don't. And the only reason I go into Barclays three or four times a day is to see if I've been paid. <laughs> Whereas if they alerted me, I'd never go in. So um, I'm far more engaged in Monzo. Which banks are doing the best jobs of adapting today? That's the theme of my new book. Uh, it's going to be called Doing Digital, um, as I always have to have digital in the title. Um, and Doing Digital is, I got fed up with people and throwing rocks at banks and saying they're rubbish, stupid, idiots, because they're not. I mean, banks are intelligent, they're not stupid. Um, but banks have this challenge of transformation, of rebuilding the bank from the ground up for the digital era. And I've identified five banks that, from what I know of them, I think that they're doing it really well. Two in Asia, two in Europe, one in America. And the one in America I'll name, just because um, it's not in the room, JP Morgan Chase. And you may say, JP Morgan Chase? JP Morgan Chase are spending $10 billion a year on technology. $10 billion a year. $3 billion a year on innovation and fintech and new projects. And as you saw from my figures, they've got rid of a third of their people through automation. They're leading in artificial intelligence and distributed ledger technology. They're opening a thousand person fintech campus between Google and Facebook's head offices in Silicon Valley. They get it, they really do. Um, and if you haven't looked at JP Morgan Chase and what they're doing, go have a look. You know, J Jamie Dimon said four years ago, Silicon Valley is coming to eat our lunch. He's, um, he's keeping his steak on the table. Um, what part of banking cannot be automated or replaced by AI? Um, a great example of what cannot be replaced is mergers and acquisitions. I was sitting with a guy in um, investment banking the other day, and we were talking about a, uh, a leveraged buyout of one of his clients, and the emotion involved is incredible. Uh, if you've re read Barbarians at the Gate, um, or if you haven't, please do. Really amazing story of the leveraged buyout of Nabisco by KKR in the USA. And when you think about somebody who's founded a company and grown it from scratch, or who has been in a company for the whole of their life and eventually became CEO, and then somebody just takes it off them in a leveraged buyout through structured finance, the emotion is incredible. You cannot automate emotions. So, um, mergers and acquisitions definitely is one area which cannot be automated. Um, and finally, how do financial regulatory environments in China, Europe, and America differ? Um, I actually, I th think I blogged about this today. I say I think because I'm not sure when it went live, but I, th I think it's, it's today. Um, China has this social credit score. So through Alipay and uh, Alibaba and Tencent and WeChat Pay and Badu and everything online, the Chinese government is monitoring your every activity di digitally. So everything you say to your friends, everything you buy, everything that you're looking at on the internet, the government can see. And they give you a score about whether you're trustworthy or not. And the more trustworthy you are, the more you get rewards. The less trustworthy you are, the more restrictions you have. For example, you can't fly if you are untrustworthy. And we may go, ooh, that's really scary. Ooh, Chinese government's terrible. Whereas I actually go, if you think that America is not watching what you're doing on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and other online services, then you're incredibly naive. So your social credit score is just as likely to exist in the USA as a European as it does in China as a Chinese citizen. Watch out. Very good. Thanks again, Chris. Cheers.
So incidentally, if you haven't read Chris's latest book, Digital Human, I strongly encourage you to do so. It's really interesting, and especially the, the, the case study he was referring to on Ant Financial. 